do you really believe he died for you and all these things? Yes, I do. Okay, check, 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 check. Okay, now there's certain things you need to, you know, try to live like this and all this. But ultimately, it's a mental propositional thing. And that's actually more Descartes than it is Christianity. That's Rene Descartes. I think, therefore I am. I think blank, therefore I am a Christian. And I think the Bible is much closer to Shakespeare, when in reality Shakespeare was just a good, he was just, he was just good at imitating the truth of the Bible. Because Shakespeare's, you know, is more like to be or not to be. And I think that's what Christianity is getting at. It's not about these little mental propositions that you have to just check off to join some kind of club or some clique that gets you into an insider status that other people lack. No, it's actually, it's going to give us a full accounting of what it means to be human, not just what God is like. As a young mother, I experienced a paradigm shift that transformed how I saw education and ultimately the world around me. I started this podcast, The Luminous Mind, to connect with and learn from people who are disrupting the status quo in how they learn, educate, and live in the world around them. Prepare for a paradigm shift. Light a candle. Light your world. Benjamin Franklin said, instead of cursing the darkness, light a candle. You're listening to The Luminous Mind with your host, Rebecca Bowman. Today's fire starter is David Gnorski. David is a writer, speaker, radio host, film director, who is dedicated to introducing Jesus' personhood revolution to the church and the broader public. A Neighbor's Choice is the name of his radio show that interviews contrarians and misfits from people locked away for life for nonviolent choices to pioneer nutrition scientists and nuclear energy entrepreneurs. What binds the show's narrative together is the way Jesus' personhood principles unlock our blindness to toxic groupthink and zero-sum coercion, or politics, then opens the door to win-win solutions and secrets left to be discovered in nature. David also does a weekly dive podcast called Things Hidden, as well as a YouTube channel at David Gernoski, where he interviews people like Jordan Peterson, theologian David Bentley Hart, Ron Paul, Peter Schiff, James Dell Davidson, blues legend Daryl Davis, and many more diverse voices, heroes, and innovators in science and technology. Welcome, David. Oh, good to be here. So happy you have me on. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on because I was recently telling a friend that David, or your work, is my new best friend. I've just listened to so much of your ideas and theories lately, and it has just illuminated my learning. I'm really hoping to bring a really disruptive show to our audience today. But before we learn more about your message, could you please tell our audience just a little bit about yourself? Sure. Well, uh, my main uh, radio show is my main work right now. I, I do a uh, radio program, a live broadcast show on FM and AM. It's also a live streaming program online uh, called A Neighbor's Choice. And then I'm a political columnist, a cultural critic on different outlets like Daily Caller and Town Hall and Fee and um, the American Conservative and various other outlets that are uh, allied to some of the ideas that I uh, articulate or at least are open-minded to sharing them. And then I have a YouTube channel that I don't really do too much with, but I do host some of my interviews. Uh, I publish some of my radio show episodes on there. And I also do um, a new podcast that's called Things Hidden. I just launched this just a few weeks ago. And I haven't pushed it out too much. I've just been kind of b building a little bit of an archive there. But it will also have episodes of my radio show. But it, it, its main feature is uh, this series I'm doing about once a week now called Things Hidden, where I do more of a deeper dive uh, for those who they listen to the radio show. And the radio show deals with news. And I have, you know, economist Walter Williams on and Peter Schiff and uh, people who call in incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, they call in from prison. It's a very wild adventure through all kinds of stuff. But then the podcast is more like a distillation where we're going to do a deep study, you know, and that's that's for the podcast. So those are some of the things I'm doing. But my uh, media project overall, I call A Neighbor's Choice. And the, the goal of it is to introduce uh, the culture 
of nonviolence that Jesus inaugurated in history and to articulate how that looks to the church and the broader public. That's kind of what I love about your message, because I see it the perfect tie between like science, anthropology to what we have learned from religion uh, versus that natural man. You know, we, we think that we're being so enlightened, but so many of our tendencies that we have tend to draw back to, you know, thousands of years ago of stuff our ancestors were doing a long time ago that just starts coming up if we don't keep these ideas of Jesus like in our personhood. And I've been thinking a lot about that toxic group think, and I just think it's interesting that I stumbled upon your work because of that, because you know that's what we're trying to do here is kind of get away from that group think and think about some things that are kind of disruptive. So your show, your message is awesome. But go ahead and give us some background as to what led you to study uh, Rene Girard's work. You know, who was he? Why did it interest you? Those kinds of things. Well, it's interesting. You know, a lot of people believe that there is no God or there is no purpose in religion because they have grown up in a culture in the West where the alleged smartest people in the room all say they don't believe in God or they're not that interested in a in a in a in a God that is interactive with the world in the way that people would might think. And so that's why we we that's why it's fashionable to not believe in God. It's fashionable to because because what happens is human beings we are we are role model imitating creatures and so if all the people in history in your current contemporary history where you study science and you study who's the einstein and who's this person Feynman and all these people you know when you those are the when the smartest people in the room are all saying yeah i believe uh, there's probably no creator that's what you guys think about um then, then people who want to be smart or people who want to, you know, fit in with what's considered smart culturally are going to mimic that and say, yeah, I've lost my faith because religion is an, is an antithesis to being intelligent. But there's no rational reason other than just trying to imitate role models that they want to be like, you know. And so that's important there is that we, we have to be able to come into that conversation and say, actually, if you just have the role models uh, in science who do the great paradigm shifting work that solve the answers left to be solved in nature, then if they are people who believe in God, then a whole new generation will imitate their smart role model. They'll be okay to believe in God too. So what, what I'm saying is that we think we pick our ideas like we're just walking brains on sticks, but we're not. We, we're imitative creatures. We imitate what we perceive those around us desiring and thinking and, 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 and posturing. Um, and so, you know, Rene Girard's work, is very helpful in seeing this process. And it's a humbling process when you really look at it. Oh, yeah, Rene Girard was a professor at Stanford University where he was the um, someone who uh, really was a groundbreaking uh, researcher in the sense that in his when he started his career, he passed away in 2015, uh, but he had a long career uh, starting in the uh, you know, 50s and 60s in academia and going all through and he had one one singular theory it's called mimetic theory and what he was doing was he was uni- he saw patterns in all the great works of western literature that they all had the same patterns where in, in the fashion of his time and still today the fashion was to look for deconstructing all meaning in the text that you read when you read a, a work of of literature or novel there's no meaning that you can pick up that's objectively there. It's just you and your subjective uh, social construction of reality making that text mean what you want it to mean. And so that is the, that was the fashion of, of Girard's time, and he went against that because what he was seeing is, no, actually there's patterns within the great works of all literature and even the plays of Shakespeare and other works they all have a similar pattern. Uh, they all have a similar pattern of, of, uh, of learning to die. There's a process in which the protagonists and their, and their stories have to have a, a process of illumination where they let go of, uh, of what Gerard calls the romantic lie of the self, the idea that you desire what you want because you truly desire those things. And Gerard found that actually what's common about these different profound works of literature that break through, you know, the, the test of time and, and go past 
their own era and resonate with us so deeply is because they cut to the bone about who we are. Uh, they, they're, they are pieces of literature that show that the uh, human beings are much more like sheep than we would think. <laughs> and uh, the Bible actually gives us that clue too, right? Yeah. Well, and I would love to hear maybe were you a religious person when you stumbled upon Rene Girard's work or was this something that kind of helped you see like that anthropology side of it, you know, more of that scientific side of how humans are? Well, it's interesting because Rene Girard, he converted to Christianity intellectually first prior to having a spiritual conversion. So he was convinced of the intellectual uh, gravity and truth of what he found in the Bible. And then he had kind of a spiritual transformation experience after. But yeah, for me, I, I was already Christian when I discovered Gerard's work. But I was always kind of a little bit um, unsatisfied with the way I thought Jesus was talked about within theological circles. Not all of them, I'm just saying, you know, in, just in my experience, um, just there seemed to be a disembodied Jesus and what I call an, an objectification of Jesus. Jesus is an object that you can attain in your life if you think there's, there's certain uh, mental propositions and you mentally assent to certain facts about Jesus. So it goes something like, you know, a, a person stumbles on to the story of Jesus and they're confronted. Okay, so who is God? His name is Jesus. Check. You know, what, is, what does he do? He does this. Check. You know, what do you have to do? You need to say sorry. You need to apologize to him. Okay, so who do I say sorry to? Say sorry to Jesus. Check. And you do this whole mental propositional thing. Do you really believe he died for you and all these things? Yes, I do. Okay, check, 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 check. Okay, now there's certain things you need to, you know, try to live like this and all this. But ultimately, it's a mental propositional thing. And that's actually more Descartes than it is Christianity. That's Rene Descartes. I think, therefore I am. I think blank, therefore I am a Christian. And I think the Bible is much closer to Shakespeare, when in reality Shakespeare was just a good, he was just, he was just good at imitating the truth of the Bible, because Shakespeare's, you know, is more like to be or not to be. And I think that's what Christianity is getting at. It's not about these little mental propositions that you have to just check off to join some kind of club or some clique that gets you into an insider status that other people lack. No, it's actually talk, it's going to, it's going to give us a full accounting of what it means to be human, not just what God is like. And that's the problem with so much of talking about Christianity today and Jesus in particular, is that everybody has a theology of Jesus. And this is something Gerard and some of his uh, followers have, have helped uh, articulate this, which is, you know, if you just have a theology of Jesus, you're going to miss the full picture because Jesus says he's both son of God and son of man. So if he's son of God, right, that, that means if you study Jesus's life, you're going to get the best picture of what it means to be God. What is God like? What's his character? Who made this place? And what's what's his personality like? Well, you look to Jesus' life, you'll get the best, best picture of that. But then he also says, I'm the son of man. He actually says that more times, right? That's That's more articulated, the son of man. So son of man would mean, what is humanity? How did humans do what we do? How did we, how did we form communities? How did we form the symbols we use? How did we form the stories we, we tell? How did we, why do we do the things we do? Why do we have the violence? Why do we have the conflict patterns that we see all throughout history? Where did this come from? And if you study Jesus on an anthropology lens, then you'll get the son of man part too. So if you only study Jesus from a theological lens, from just the spiritual and theological side, you're not going to get the full Jesus. And you're not going to get the full Bible. But if you say, wait a second, when I study this life of Jesus, I need to think not just theologically, but also anthropologically. What does this say about the origins of man? You know, what does this say about why we do the things we do in our relationships? Why we do the things we do in our workplace? It's more, it's more, it's more related to reality, right? And so if you don't have that, then you'll, you'll just believe certain things about Jesus, but it won't actually impact your fingertips in your life. And then you'll just go along and do your religion thing as like a private thing that you do, and it's compartmentalized away from your eating habits and your workplace choices and your money decisions and your politics and your economics. All those, you can connect little dots and make them all kind of fit, but it's all separate stuff. That's the way we think of it, because we have a theology without an anthropology. 
And so we're not doing it right. We're doing, we're making Jesus like a disembodied deity, like every other pagan religion has ever been, where it's all about this, this ascent outside of the, the domain of the flesh and the domain of matter and the things of tangible earthiness. So, you know, when you're dealing with Jesus, it's not that pie in the sky. It's way more earthy and way more practical for understanding uh, everyday problems that we all face. You know, when you get into this, you know, when children are at school and they get bullied and because they're different or, you know, they, they find cliques and peer pressure, the Bible's all about that. And it's not like it, it's all about, you know, it's all about how to understand what's happening to you and how to get out of that. Uh, and, and, and so much, you know, why do workplaces go awry? It's all in, and it's all in Jesus's life, but you have to understand that he's going to help you see how mankind came about, how we ordered our way of doing things and then how those things go, go problematic. Well, and I mean, it's just fascinating. I'm just like listening to you cause I'm waiting for more and more. Cause like I said, I've studied this so much of what you've been saying about it. I want to talk about too, like later on as we get going, like why the generations, why we're seeing a disconnect with religion, with millennials and people who are younger. And I think you're starting to answer that question for us, but we'll get into that a little bit sooner, but let's kind of talk about like some of the definitions of what Rene Gennard set out for us what the Bible helps us understand. And one is that the definition of the, the minic theory and then that scapegoat mechanism. Tell us it's a little all, bit it's more It's all one that. theory. Yeah, okay. it's, called, it's called mimetic, mimetic theory. Mimetic. In the first, yeah, mimetic. So mimetic, it's a fancy word. It just means imitation. But he chose that mimetic. word because he wanted to make it clear that this is not just the same thing as rote imitation. Because when you say to someone, humans imitate each other, people say, yeah, what else is new? You know, they don't understand the significance of the claim he's making there, right? Uh-huh. So he's not just saying, uh, you know, we, we, we get, you know, we wear the, the more surface stuff of rote imitation, like you stick your tongue out, someone else sticks their tongue back. You know, you wear the same shirt that everybody else and your click at school wears, all that kind of stuff. That's like the superficial stuff that humans will concede. Yeah, people do that. Not me, of course. You know, everybody always says, <laughs> yeah, everybody imitates. Not me. I'm, I'm unique, though. No one gets me. I'm special. You know, everybody thinks that, right? But what Gerard is saying, no, actually, imitation is way more fundamental to the concept, to, to your own sense of self. Uh, you know, they, you know, little infants, you know, when they're born, little newborns, they're already imitating uh, their parents as soon as they uh, come out. You know, it, within 10 seconds or so, they're doing facial patterns similar to their adults. And then, you know, they, they're, they're constantly imitating everything they do um, to, to learn who they are and what life is and how to function and how to move your head and how to tilt your head when you're laughing and how to sneeze. Uh, you know, they, they <laughs> learn how to sneeze in the same pattern that their mommy or daddy does. So they're, they're, they're imitating almost everything you can imagine. Uh, that's why children who are abandoned in the wild in those stories, some of those are legendary and embellished of children abandoned in the wild in the forest and jungle book type stuff. You know, some of that's, again, a little bit exaggerated, but some of those cases were true where children would be left in the woods at a young age and they never were able to fully become individual humans, right? They, they, a lot of these children, if they were left at an earlier, at, to a certain, if they're left at an earlier age, so they're, they haven't been fully, you know, socialized into humanness by adults and they're at an early enough age it's almost like it permanently stunts their ability to uh, ever become truly human in the way that we understand human humanness to be. And so that's why, you know, that there's some certain cases of children lost in the wild children, or they call it feral children where they're, they're never able to sit and, and have, you know, order and, and not have panics and flights because they, they, you need that critical time to become a human. So we're, we're not individuals, we're, we're interdividual, we're socially constructed through our relationships. Well, I thought it was interesting, too, when I was studying it, that even when we think we're being different, we have to actually look at what, you know, we feel like the norm is or whatever for us. to. So even me be saying I'm doing some disruptive thinking, I have to look at what the more of the norm is doing for me to to make the distinction of what I'm doing is different, <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, and every, every great, uh, unique, uh, innovator was inspired by a unique innovator before them. And every great composer like Bach and Mozart, they are unique and they do original stuff, but they're also imitating role models that have come before them. And so, yeah, even when you're, even when you're, you know, if you go to a school and everybody is dressed in a country or, you know, uh, country culture or whatever you want to call it, 
And then you say, well, I'm going to be different. I'm going to wear all black to show them that I'm not them. Well, you're still looking to your neighbor to decide how you're going to present yourself. So you're still borrowing. That's right. That's, that's, a, that's a form of imitation because you're getting your cues from those around you for how you're going to present yourself. And so, so, you know, but the Bible's clear about that's what we do. I mean, it says all we like have gone astray, each into our own way. And a sheep really thinks, you know, think about it. A sheep goes astray by following another sheep off a cliff or something, right? Yeah. And, and so that, that's a very, it's kind of a, it's a subtle statement that the Bible's making in that, those passages. Because, you know, that's how humans go astray. We go astray by imitating someone else going off into the wrong direction, right? But we don't, we don't think we're sheep. So we don't think, you know, we don't think we're copying anybody. So that's why we were, we're lost. Right. And so that's the point is like to become a true human and to become a true human individual with in personhood, you have to fully understand that so much of what you desire is modeled for you by subconscious, uh, you know, imitation of other people's desires. So you don't want that fancy car because you just think it's objectively good. You want that car because you think it will help allow people in your community to feel like you are on their level at a certain social status level. So it's like, you know, I am here now. So I'm, I'm, I'm positioning myself on the status hierarchy to let other people in the community know that I am, you know, I'm here, I'm there. I'm not, I'm keeping up with the Joneses or I'm beating them if I can. And, uh, you know, so yeah, when we want to do disruption, that's why everybody in San Francisco is a radical disruptor. And why are they all saying that? Because they're copying each other and that's okay. I'm, I'm talking about Silicon Valley or whatever, you know, we're always, you know, we, we have these fads that are, are the obvious examples of that. But what Gerard was saying with mimetic desire is that we don't just desire the things that we see other people doing, we desire what we perceive them trying to do. So we want to copy what they're doing uh, because ultimately we want to be them. We want to desire their being. And that's what idolatry is. That's what it means to, when, when the Ten Commandments say, you should not have any other God before me. Well, we make gods of our, of our neighbors all the time because we, we always, whether they're richer than us or poorer than us, there's always somebody we can find and say, you know, something about what they're doing in their life, they look like they have way more completeness and satisfaction than what I have. And so, I, you know, and, and, and we, don't, we don't think this out clearly, but this is how we feel sometimes. So we, we look at someone and say, is this just something I could, if I could just be more like that, they, they do, or, or like this, or, or if I could get that car they have, or if I could get those kind of friends that they have, if I could talk the way they do, if I could learn the skill that they're the best at, maybe others would like me and maybe others, you know, maybe I would feel complete like they seem to look to me. But that's that grass is greener on the other side illusion, right? Is that things from far away, they look very attractive. But then the closer you get to them, then as you get closer to them, now you see all the more human flaws, the the problems, the the mistakes. And then, then you're not as, you know, then you want to repel away from them. Like, you know, well, oh, that's not exactly what I thought it was, you know. And so that's the push-pull that Gerard talks about human desire is. It, it draws us in, it attracts us, and then it repels us when we get too close. What humans, it's not, it's not a one direction, right? Because if you're imitating someone and other people want to be imitated, so we all want others to learn from us. That's why we have kids and then we want them to imitate what we're trying to do. But then, you know, obviously we don't want people to imitate us too much, right? And that's why, you know, like you see, you know that copycat game that kids play? Mm -hmm. You know, where they're, they copy everything you say, you know, and, and adults will say they're so rational and, and cool headed. But everyone knows if someone keeps playing that game long enough, it makes you feel like you're going crazy. Right. If they just say everything you say after you, you know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's an example that we don't want people to imitate us too much because it will lose our sense of self. And, and it's the same thing for like if you're at a company and uh, there's a, a charismatic founder of a company. And he has a vision and a philosophy, philosophy for life and business and so forth and innovation. And so he, you know, they hire an, an intern. And at first the intern, you know, when the CEO, if he ever thinks about that intern, says, you know, he, he wants that intern to imitate everything he's doing. But then what happens if a few years later that intern has imitated him so well that now he's vice president? <laughs> and now, you know. Now the board is getting tired of the founder because the founder's a little too crazy and he's lost his touch from his original days. And now there's this younger or whatever 
you know, VP who is just the, the hot new thing. And they're going to say, I think he needs to be in that position. So now you don't want him to imitate you. You don't want him to take your position because you were the original. You were the innovator. You were the true master of whatever it is you think is special about you. But now somebody else is stolen your thunder, you know, and that, yeah. that's why, you know, we all are like that. We can't escape it. It's in everything we do. You know, it could it could be, you know, it could be something as simple as uh, you make the best uh, dish at uh, Thanksgiving. And you want someone to learn and, and copy that so you can pass your special ingredients down in your recipe. But then one day they make it way better. Then you feel like you've lost your specialness because everybody always said, you know, oh, we can't wait for Thanksgiving because we're going to get your whatever you make. And then their casserole or something. And then somebody else is making it. It's way better. It just blows your original idea out of the water. Now, some people, if they're, in a, if they're, if they're wise, right, and they're humble, which is what Jesus teaches us how to be, then they don't they don't have conflict with that. But a lot of people that starts conflict. Mm -hmm. Yeah. When they lose their sense of self because people are. Talking to them. Well, and is that where the scapegoat mechanism comes in play? I mean, you said that they're the same, like that's the same thing. But in my mind, they seem very different. Yeah, well, it, it, it's just uh, well, you can have so you can become obsessed with your rivals. That's why they call them frenemies, you know, <laughs> Um was this thing that Kanye West was talking about how he always, you know, idolized Jay-Z. And then when they got closer, they became friends and then they became rivals. And then it's on and off again. That's exactly what Gerard did. But he's just getting that from the Bible. Right. Look at Cain and Abel, two brothers. They have conflict. Right. And it's because, you know, similarity breeds contempt. You know, for that, that, that saying of, you know, it's what, you know, good fences make good neighbors. Right. Uh -huh. uh, you know. That crazed man who attacked Rand Paul, allegedly he said it was because a few yard clippings were on his side of the property line. You know, yeah. so there's an example of a crazed mimetic desire. It's because he feels like his sense of self, which his property is an extension of, is losing its its sense of, of what it is because <laughs> apparently there's a few yard clippings that sometimes cross the border. <laughs> so so he this man is that's an, it's a great example of mimetic desire going nuts because he goes and tackles a man because his his leaves are too far over i mean in break you know hurts him viciously but this happens all the time you know that's what you see and and humans are unique in this is because you know the reason why gerard found the scapegoat mechanism is because he's saying well how do we exist how do we how does the human species still exist since we copy each other not just for the good things but also the bad things so imitation is not a bad thing. Mimetic desire is not a bad thing. What's bad is when we idolize those around us as little gods, as we, we want to be them so much that we try to devour whatever it is about them. And then, and then we get covetous, right? That's what the Ten Commandment, the Tenth Commandment is about. Thou shalt not covet. The emphasis is on the neighbor there, right? The emphasis is not on the objects. It says, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's this, thy neighbor's that or anything else that belongs to thy neighbor, the focus is on the neighbor. So your choice as a neighbor is to not desire to be your neighbor. All the things that you desire from your neighbor are actually just symbols of what you really want, which is to be like your neighbor, right? Because that's what we were designed to be. Humans were designed to be in relationship. We are not individual islands. We are designed to find meaning in relationship by learning and being in communion with another. And that's wonderful because we're made in an image of God who has, who also has relationship in his very being prior to the universe existing. And so he makes the universe in that image and he makes us especially in his image, which is why we, we need that relational reality to be, to be us. But the problem is we want to worship our neighbors and our rivals, and then we become obsessed with beating them. So here's how it turns into a scapegoat. You know, if you have people having conflict all the time, you first of all, you're never going to be able to function. You're never going to be able to store up food for winter or famine or a rainy day. You're never going to be able to function and order things so that people are not killing each other. So if everybody's imitating people in a bad way, it spreads like a contagion, you know. Mm -hmm. So if everybody's stealing from everybody else and everybody's, uh, you know, uh, being uh, gossiping and uh, uh, burying their teeth at each other and being very seedy and sneaky or being very uh, accusatory and paranoid, it's going to destroy the, the human community. Yeah, the whole civilization, so, right? 
So how how are we still here? That's the, the big question. If you if you're like, well, what what does a scapegoat have to do with anything? Well, then tell me how are we still here if you know what humans are like? Because wolves and other animals, they don't go on genocidal campaigns. You know, when a wolf beats another wolf to be the leader of the pack, the wolf that loses, the beta wolf, submits his neck for the alpha wolf to strike. And the alpha wolf does not take the final strike. And same for moose or elephants. How do animals kill each other in the process of a fight? Yes. But there but when the other has submitted, there is no vindictive little extra kill. You know what I mean? Humans are not like that. We're vindictive and petty and we keep grudges. Right? So in a human conflict, because we're imitating bad ideas or bad energy and bad paranoia, you uh, kill my pet, and then I go back and kill your friend, and then you go back and kill my family, and then whoever's left goes back and tries to go against your village. Yeah. And then whoever, whoever survives from that village massacre, they go on and they, go and they, and they, they brood and try to find a way to build an army to destroy your nation 500 years later. <laughs> that's what all human <laughs> conflict, right? Yeah, so it's an eye case, for an eye, right? <laughs> yeah, so if that's the case, an eye for an eye was actually limiting that, right? Because in the ancient world, people people always like to criticize the Bible by using the Bible's own character. Because that's the only way they know how to criticize, because they're fully enmeshed in Christianity, because the, the Christian worldview is the very uh, water in the fishbowl of the West. And so they always they can only critique the Bible within the Bible's unique standards. So that passage of the eye for an eye, people say, oh, that's so barbaric. No, it's not. It's actually limiting what was the way of doing things in the in the time of, of the world at that time, which was an, you, you take out my eye, I take out your whole body. So you see what I mean? It's escalation yeah. of aggression. It's yeah. pathetic escalation of anger and violence. So the so the, the Bible is trying to deal with people as humanity is. It, it's, it's a process. Obviously, we don't want to stay at eye for an eye. That's a that would be that would be slipping back into a lower level of where we're supposed to go in light of Jesus coming into history. But yeah, eye for an eye was a gracious move away from the barbarity of mimetic desire going out of control, because uh, you know because in the ancient world it, it was escalating aggression to point of extinction. So so the question is that everyone needs to be thinking about is why are we still here then? Why did we exist if that's the way we have conflict? There had to be a way. Since we're so imitationally driven people in, as, as a species, there had to be a process that we could imitate each other together without killing everybody. <laughs> well, and that's what I really right? love. It makes logical sense. Yeah. As I've been listening to your stuff, too, uh, you kind of drive us through how the biblical text takes it, how we have that connection with that ancient myths. And some of those myths are, you know, basically old stories of things that happened and then and then how that uh, how the Bible helps us kind of uh, what is it deconstruct our thought processes from the way, you know, that we did things in the pagan world to now what's going on in the Bible to, you know, from the Old Testament to the New Testament. I mean, I've had friends that talk about, wow, the Bible seems so barbaric and, you know, just this massive thing of killing, you know, lots of uh, sacrifice and all of that. But, you know, take us through like history and how that's actually helped change us to be so that we see it as barbaric. Yeah. (laughs) Well, think about it this way. You know, if you're a barbaric person and you look in the mirror, you're not going to like what you see, are you? Right? <laughs> so so we blame the mirror, not ourselves. Right? That's what we do. So when we look at the Bible, we say, oh, my goodness, that's so barbaric. Because we don't want to look at the mirror about who humanity is. Right? The Bible gives you the full sausage making of human society. Exactly. Yeah. It's going to show you how the sausage is made. And if you if you're not ready for that, if you want to be a little immature, then that's why the Bible gets thrown out the wayside by people or they twist it to justify their sausage making of violence that they're doing today. Yeah. See? yeah. Well, and that's <laughs> so. what I love about what you were saying before is that's that what... anthropology, you know, you, you have to understand like the anthropology of man versus the uh, like the theology of God, you know, type of thing and how that all kind of fits right. together of how we can actually look at the sausage factory and not, (laughs) you know, be a gas. Well, I mean, that's the thing is that, you know, we want to kill the messenger. The the Bible is the messenger for the history of how man came to be, how we didn't go extinct, what our temptations are in terms of why we do the things we do to make our communities and make our meaning. 
together and, and have our societies function, it reveals it all. And it reveals it all in process. It's a process that's taking place. And so people don't want to wake up to their comfortable, they don't want to wake up to their comfortable lies. So whenever they read the Bible, they're always going to find a way again to to butcher it in a way that that is an obvious betrayal of the intention of the text, or they're going to, you know, just scapegoat it and say, no, you guys, you Christians are the bane of all of our existence. But it's, it's uh, and, and, and to be fair, you know, obviously the Christians have failed to understand Jesus 2019 years later. Uh, so we have failed to, we have failed to truly reckon with the simple, staggering, beautiful reality that Jesus brought to light in humanity. But we're slowly moving there. We're slowly, because the Bible, remember it says the kingdom of heaven is like yeast working itself in a loaf. It's a process. Or it's like a, a mustard seed that becomes a big mustard, uh, you know, a big tree with a lot, a lot of birds in it, right? You know, it's a slow process if you wanted to watch that mustard seed turn into a big elaborate tree, right? Yeah. And so, but, but you know, it, that's a slow process. And that's the same thing we see since Jesus uh, came into history is it's been a slow process for humanity to understand, well, why is it that we do violent things like this? And then they always want to look at other texts, like I saw a quote from Sam Harris quoting uh, Jane, a, a Jane uh, leader, about a nonviolent language. You know, he was saying things about don't, don't kill and don't do these things, and this was some religion in, in, in the India called Jainism, an ancient religion there. But, but how come it didn't take, you know? How come it didn't take? That's the thing I want to know. So there's something unique about what the Bible does in the way it exposes human nature and all of its mistakes. It doesn't just lecture us, you know? It doesn't just say from the beginning, don't kill and don't kill and, and don't do this and don't do that and don't do this. No, it shows you what happens when we do the bad stuff. And it shows you how we're trying to stumble in the darkness to slowly grow up as a species. So again, so why did we go extinct if we go out of control with our, our violence escalating? It's because when we can imitate each other in a way that, that doesn't just destroy the community, then we can channel our aggression in a way that doesn't uh, like wipe us all out. So if we're all imitating each other by pointing our fingers at each other, it's, a, it's not that hard to imagine that that imitational spirit can start to turn into one direction. Because you know, if people are in a state of uh, conflict or alienation, because of, uh, of uh, again, violence spreads like a contagion. And, and we know this. Like, if you look at cities racked by the drug war, where a community is hit with a wave of violence, it spreads like a virus, right, to all kinds of communities that are in the vicinity, neighborhoods and things, and it spreads. You can almost see it spread like a virus. The shootings, the killings, the revenge, it spreads and spreads and, and spreads, and it, and it becomes like a stronghold almost like an institution that oppresses people. And that's the way we, we do when we don't, when we, imi when we imitate each other's um, envy and uh, jealousy and uh, aggression and paranoia. So if we're all imitating each other like that, it can be the way you resolve that without going extinct is that you start blaming a singular person and saying that person is the one that caused this problem. You know, you and I were fighting over who stole the chicken. Uh, because we're missing a chicken in our backyard, but it's actually that person over there who looks different than us. That person is a witch. And I think this person put a spell on us and made us go crazy. So we need to get rid of that person. And then everybody else agrees and says, yeah, I think that person is too. Look how different they are. And that could be anything, anything that stands out in a community, too rich, too beautiful, uh, disfigured, a uh, handicap, a minority, someone who came from a strange land, who was visiting from a far off land, anybody who has something that's almost arbitrarily different. But they need to have a little bit of insiderness too, right? Because if they're totally different, then it doesn't explain how they cause the problem of the of the local bad blood, right? You got they gotta have enough of the contamination of the local community to make them a believable scapegoat, a believable villain who caused everything. So it needs to be someone who is a little bit arbitrarily different, but also inside the community. And so that's where this process of, of looking and then seeing someone that the whole community through the toxic power of group becomes convinced that they truly did cause the problem. And then they scapegoat that person and they kill them. And that's why 
at the earliest levels of human civilization, we see evidence of cannibalism and all over the world behavior. Why do we see cannibalism? Yeah. Well, and that's what you know I, I love. Mean? Yeah. With that scapegoat thing, that's kind of where, you know, we we uh, where I was trying to to get you to go where, you know, those ancient myths that we talked about, like things that happened way before the Bible. Um, but we see it all through history now. You know, we can see it all the way down to our time with uh, using a scapegoat to help correct the the problem so we don't end up killing each other. Right. To end up. Well, why do uh, well, let, let, ask this question? Why do all these gods and these myths? A lot of times they have something weird or or something's off about them. They have something different. Uh, they're they're extra pretty or they're extra tall. Or oftentimes we see they have some disfigurement. Oedipus rock, walks with a limp. He's got a a, a, a messed up gait, right? Mm -hmm. So. Why is it that all these different gods have these uh, disfigurements or handicap features? Why is that? Anybody have any idea? I mean, that's, I mean any, is, there, is there another idea out there about maybe how that came about? Why is that? I, I'm not really sure. You know, go ahead and tell us. <laughs> well, I mean, I mean, it's like it's to me, it's like it's it's, it's a tell there that the gods are not necessarily this just artificially constructed out of fantasy, right? Because that's what modernist people want us to believe is that mythology was just man's way of, of, of using our creativity to express our imagination and, and have campfire stories that make us happy. That's, very, that's a very superficial reading that conveniently keeps people from confronting the origins of man so that they can keep scapegoating the Bible and other things like that as the thing that holds us back. But uh, so... So the reason why you see these little disfigurements or, you know, Medusa's face is scary, you know, all these different things. Cyclops has one eye. It's because those are oftentimes scapegoats for people who had a, a physical handicap or had an impairment or something that was an easy, arbitrary marker of some little bit of difference them stand out in a sea of sameness if everybody's struggling to fit in and in, in that sameness they're all imitating each other and then someone kind of stands out a little bit they're an easy mark for hey that person's different get them yeah and yeah. they really believe it people really believe that uh that person's guilty yeah because we're not rationally thinking this through we're just going along and imitating just like i said at the beginning why does everybody believe it's it's cool to not believe in God because all the cool people in the room say they don't believe it. So they just want to be cool. They want to fit in. They want people to think that they're smart. So they don't, they haven't rationally felt it through. There are intelligent arguments about God, you know, against God too, but that's not really what makes the choice. What makes you make that desire to say, I don't believe in God or whatever is because you want to fit in. And it's the same thing for believing in God. Oftentimes it's just trying to fit in because that's what your culture raised you to do and you want to fit in. But that's what we do. But, uh, you know, when it comes to the origins of, of mythology, mythology is, a, is like humans' ability to, to, to try to explain how that original scapegoat mechanism created order, right? Uh -huh. Because when you scapegoat someone and you, you cast all the blame onto them and say, you caused this famine, you caused the plague, you caused the child's death, whatever it is that sets everybody off into a spirit of frenzy and and stress, then when everybody comes together, they were hating each other before, and they were stressed out at each other before, and then they release that stress, they release that tension, they release that blame and accusation all into one direction, and it feels relieving. It feels like a release. And when that happens, all of a sudden, it feels almost like a miracle has occurred because we were about to destroy each other. But just in a moment, we figured out that this person was the bad blood, this one was a demon, this one was the bad guy, this one was the witch, this one was the whatever, whatever the word you want to use to make a scapegoat, because that's what they've been doing for thousands of years. And this person gets destroyed, and that gives you a high that makes you feel almost like you've lost your sense of self because you've let go of all of that ugliness, and you really feel righteous in what you've done. You feel like you have saved the community. And then what they did was they said, wait a second humans did this they said this person must have been a god because look how they brought us together and we're able to solve problems <laughs> again and save up food and now we're not going to die in the winter so what was happening was this was a spirit this must have been something better than any of us uh, this must have been some ancestor who came back to teach us a lesson or something this must be a spirit or something telling us that this is the way we solve our problems this is how we stop destroying ourselves is we have to practice this, what we just 
accidentally fell into. And, where we channel all of our passion and anger into one person. Yeah, See? and and by making it a god, it takes away maybe the the guilt that you would feel too, right? Because, uh, I, I mean, I, yeah, because you say, well, that was a guilt, but there to teach us a lesson. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Well, and let's kind of move through like that biblical text when we talk about um, like Abraham. I loved how you were talking. You know, I, I had listened to, to one before where you talked about Abraham and how, um, you know, with his sacrifice to of Isaac, all of a sudden, like God with that sacrifice, he he stopped that scapegoat mechanism uh, situation right. that was going on. I mean, then that began yeah, animal because, sacrifice, right. but but go ahead and talk about that a little yeah. bit. So it's like so sacrifice is like our pacifier, you know, it helps soothes us. Yeah, right? that that's what like our origin is is that we have this this desire basically to have some kind of a sacrifice or a scapegoat. Like that's the natural, that's our natural inclination, right. basically, right? Right. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be that way. I think that, I think God designed us to not do that, but we made, we wanted to make God in our own image, and that's what we've been working on ever since. Uh -huh. and, our, and the God of our own image is sacrificial. The God of our own image is ego, and all about you know might makes right, and um, the real God, uh, he can only get us to listen to him by allowing us to expel him in our little fits of rage and righteous indignation. So that's the only way he gets us to hear him is through expelling him and everybody who is imitating his true character. Check out the rest of our interview with David Gnorski next week. Thank you for listening to The Luminous Mind. Music featured in this episode from Scott Holmes. To learn more about our podcast, check us out at theluminousmind.net.